that it isn't that easy to get to. By August of 1979, it was home. And uh, I used to curse, and I still do, uh, coming down for uh, 495, I guess. There's a sign there that says Hog Brook. And I hated it because it meant I still had about another 45 minutes to an hour to go. And I cursed it, and I said, you know, someday I'm going to, this is just a stop. Southbridge is just a career stop. I'll be out of there in two years, and I'll be gone. But then I realized I was kind of like a blue-collar Milltown daily newspaper editor. I really like these small towns. Um, and so uh, in 79, I, I kind of went from conservative New Hampshire to moderate Massachusetts and brought my family with me. And uh, for them, uh, New Hampshire uh, is where they were born for my daughters, but uh, uh, Southbridge is really their hometown, and uh, they're still down in this area now. Um, it was really great for me today because I arrive in town, I always get the Southbridge news, and the lead story on the paper was book sale today and Jacob Ed Words library. Now, I love books. I mean, I made a mistake years ago of, uh, at the library. I bought everything that was left on the last day of the book sale. Took about three or five or six or ten loads to get it to the house. <laughs> it wasn't pretty when I got home, and I had a lot of um, explaining to do, but uh, it was good. And uh, I just want to say it's good to see a lot of friends here. It's del I'm delighted that Eric Pinder is here with, with students from the uh, New Hampshire Institute of Art. Um, the students, uh, their college closed last year. It was Chester College, and the Institute uh, picked up the uh, creative writing program, and Eric came with it. And so it's really cool to have you down here. I'm delighted. Eric's a hell of a writer. Um, spent a lot of time on the top of Mount Washington and has written some books. Just had a very nice children's book out. So I'm delighted. But back to the chamber. Um, just up the road from here is uh, Dexter Res Russell. And I used to know it as Russell Harrington. And it's the largest manufacturer of professional cutlery in the, company, in the, in the country. Uh, they make paint, pizza knives, uh, paring knives, everything in between. And I got to tell you, they're really quality knives. Uh, J.I. Morris uh, is the largest, uh, man, world's largest manufacturer of miniature screws and fasteners. Doesn't mean much, but if you look in your purse, you might have a J.I. kit for repairing your glasses. Little screws that go in there and the whole bit. And then just up the road from them is. Uh, uh, the uh, high tools, and they make scrapers and uh, paint and glass tools, and you'll see them in stores all over the place. You probably get one in the bottom of your drawer or on the top of your workbench. So this is a really ethnic community. What drew me here was in, uh, in the early 80s, there were um, about 17 identifiable um, ethnic groups here. And uh, the town has several Catholic churches, several Protestant, a small Jewish congregation. It also has a Greek Orthodox, a Romanian Orthodox, and an Albanian Orthodox church in addition to a Polish church. So it's a rich, rich community. And uh, so it was a great place, I thought, to bring up kids. I mean, unfortunately, my daughters have a memory of a good friend of theirs, Kong Bumfase Song who remembered swimming across this river for his freedom and seeing his mother get shot as they were trying to escape their country to come to freedom. And so you learn a lot about um, the struggles of others. And Southbridge is also known as the Eye of the Commonwealth. And uh, this building is why. Is why. Um, at, one, at one point, this was the largest uh, eyeglass manufacturing facility in the country. In the world, as a matter of fact, and that's what really brought all the immigrants here. Was uh, you used to have, uh, and you still do, a large uh, population of Italians here who were just renowned for their work with glass. Um, I, I can remember going to a United Lens up here. They make the little blanks, and there were there were skilled craftsmen working in individual little pieces with their little paddles, creating uh, lens blanks. Uh, when I came here, the company had just been sold by the Wells family. Uh, it was owned by Warner Lambert, and it was really a, a chance for me to uh, really deal with uh, a, a really big corporate 
company, and it wasn't always the best of relations by any means. Um, the Wells, a few of the Wells still remained in town. Um, and the legacy of the Wells family was that um, it's this building, it's the optical history, and also the family collected things. They collected antiques, uh, John collected clocks, and they had this strange knack of collecting buildings from throughout New England. And the big legacy for all of us now is what we know as Old Sturbridge Village. And I know you were invited to visit there later this weekend. Uh, if you remember the famed pictures of Douglas MacArthur, he's got that long pipe and he's got those glasses. Those are the aviator glasses. And uh, those were made right here. And this is also a building in which fiber optics had uh, really had some development history to it. Um, there were some folks named Will Hicks and Brian O'Brien who were like uh, pioneers in something in the 50s that is now, you know, everyday mentioned uh, in the fiber optics field. And if you were here in the 50s, you might see a guy walking around. He's here talking with the scientists about this new cinematography he wants to develop. He's got a famous wife. His name is Mike Todd. And he creates this new uh, motion picture technology. And uh, it, it's used, and the first films are Oklahoma and Around the World in 30 Days. Uh, Mike Todd goes on to die in a plane crash. He leaves the widow, Elizabeth Taylor. And uh, the company still exists, but now it's a sound editing company. I think they won a uh, Academy Award for Private Ryan. So all of this in this little town of about 15 to 17,000 people. When I first arrived here, we were called down because Warner Lambert Summer, you know, kind of said, come on down and see what's going on. And, um, in 1980, Bob Greasy was here to unveil his uh, line of uh, eyeglasses. And uh, Dorothy Hamill had been here about the same time with her Dorothy Hamill signature eyeglasses. So, I mean, I have affection for the community for a lot of reasons. I think it's a nice small town, very manageable, but it has a great history. Um, and then I went uh, a few years later, I, I commuted. Uh, kids stayed here in the local schools and with their friends to Willimantic, which is up in about 40 minutes from here. Um, and I went from the largest eyeglass manufacturer to Willimantic, the home of the largest thread manufacturer. And, uh, but in Willimantic, American thread had moved south and, you know, American optical really exists on paper and not much more. Is that right, <laughs> It may come back, who knows. Um, and so, Willem, I, I guess I tell stories because I, I learn things and, and I'm always fascinated. It's the journalist in me. Um, and I have to tell you that the journey is always interesting because it was my stay in Willimantic that helped me as a book editor um, about three or four years ago. Um, I do. A, we did a series of books. His, his name is Fritz Weatherby. If you're from New Hampshire, he's on the New Hampshire version of Chronicle on channel on CVB TV Channel Five. Um, Fritz is a storyteller, and he. Uh, I, I've done his books. We've done eight. We did a thousand stories in eight volumes, and you know, he's kind of crusty and you know, typical New Hampshire guy. So we get along. <laughs> And uh, so we were having a little chat, and I said, Fritz, I know you had the story on TV, but I yanked the frog story from the book. So I thought, you know, you know how authors are with publishers and get a little upset and throw something at you, storm out the window, out the door, and all of that. So, so I said, Fritz, I got to tell you, fate has been good to me. It's put me in some interesting places, and. Years ago, I was in a place called Willimantic, Connecticut. And I said, if you know anything about Connecticut government, it's that Yukon is located in Stores. And Stores is a town within the town of Mansfield. Not many people know that Yukon's in Mansfield. I said, Willimantic is a city within the town of Wyndham. 
And this is where we get confused, because Fritz, in your story that you wanted me to publish, we have a story of this small New Hampshire town, and it takes place in the late 1600s, early 1700s, and it's just relatively been settled. And one uh, night, the residents rush into the garrison house for protection because they hear ungodly screams from the darkness. And it means that the Indians are on the prowl. They're killing people. It's a massacre. All night long, the people huddle inside the fort, thinking the Indians are coming to kill them. Screaming, ungodly screaming. And so the next morning, they go out, they venture forth, they head down, they get to the pond. And what happened was the pond had dried up overnight. And thousands and gazillions of frogs had died. And they were in their death throes, and they were doing whatever frogs do when they're dying. That sounds far-fetched, I agree, but it's a true story. And I said, the problem is, Fritz, you said it took place in Wyndham, New Hampshire. And I have to tell you that it, did. it took place in Wyndham, Connecticut. And I know because there's a damn frog on the state on the city's flag. <laughs> and they just built a new bridge uh, in the downtown area. And Connecticut likes to have public art. And so on one side of the bridge are two giant cement spools of thread to honor that. And on the other side are these two giant bullfrogs. <laughs> and if you don't know what's going on, you're saying, why? And I've had this happen. People will call me and say, hey, I'm going through Willimantic. What's with the bullfrogs? <laughs> and so Fritz was pretty good. I thought he'd get upset and, and all. He said, you know, that does make sense because I did get the story right out of the Wyndham history. And so it, it's legitimate and all. But, you know, there was a great migration in New England in the 1600s and the 1700s. Connecticut got settled really pretty early. And, you know, most of the second, third, fourth borns moved out. They had to go to new pastures. And so they did come forward. And so people in Wyndham, Connecticut, like to take credit for the uh, formation of Wyndham, Maine, and Wyndham, Vermont, that Archer writes about all the time, and Wyndham, New Hampshire. And so Fritz kind of figured that, you know, if you, you, know, you show up in Wyndham, New Hampshire in 1690, and uh, you tell a granddaddy's story about the frogs, it really doesn't matter if it's New Hampshire or Connecticut. It's a hell of a frog story. And so it just gets perpetuated, and then some guy comes along and decides to write the history of Wyndham, New Hampshire, and he puts in there some of granddaddy's stories. So it's always been cautionary for me that when I'm doing stories by storytellers and they try to base it on fact, that uh, you got to be a little careful, and you always have to, you know, put in the introduction that these are all true stories. Wink, wink. So I can't. So that's the story of Fritz, <laughs> and why I dislike frogs. <laughs> um, I I started my book publishing career here. Um, I grew up in Concord, New Hampshire, and I live there now. Um, Parents were good to me. They allowed me to belong to two book clubs. It wasn't the Columbia Record Club, which I could have killed them with, you know. But um, uh, there were two books, uh, a series of books by Random House. One was all about books. And I don't know if you remember these or not, but it was like all about whales, all about birds, all about flowers, nonfiction, really entertaining, educational, and a whole bit. And the other was the landmark books, which was kind of a fictionalized version of real stories. And then there never was a Wyndham Frog book in there. But um, and the one that I really loved was Francis Marion, the Swamp Fox. <laughs> and you remember Swamp Fox because it's a kind of based on the movie that Mel Gibson did, The Patriot. You know, fight the uh, fight the British, live in the swamps, and the whole bit. But I loved it, and it was a TV show that Disney did. Um, back in the 50s, and Leslie Nielsen was the Swamp Fox. I loved it. And so it turned out that um, 
a neighbor down the street, her cousin wrote the book, Swamp Fox. And he was a well-known writer in the uh, 50s. His name was Stuart Holbrook. He was just a respected writer. And one day, he was going to visit the Stuarts. And I stood under this giant old elm tree with my precious book, waiting for him to show up and sign it. And you know what? He never showed up. <laughs> I was crushed. But sooner or later, the book got signed. But it's always taught me about trying to do the right thing and take care of people, and a special relationship that we all have with books and writers and all. So I still drive by that tree, and it kind of anchors me and brings me back to what writers are. I mean, Stuart didn't know I was waiting for him or anything, but you know, it's 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 a it's a it's a rooting. Um, when I was at the paper, we used to have a book page. We had an editor, a uh, book editor. It was part time. Uh, his name was Roland Boutwell, and Roland uh, was a book dealer. And uh, as I bought out the library's books once, I bought out Roland's garage of used books, and I paid the price for that as well. But it kept me busy for a whole summer, just sorting books, reselling them a little bit. Roland was also, uh, he was a Baptist, preaching in a Methodist church, and so I didn't get these things, but I, I figured that's, that's how the world works. And um, Roland said, you know, we ought to publish something. We ought to, we ought to do something. We don't have any money. I'm a preacher, and you're a newspaper editor, and we ought to do something. So he's, his grandkids had been over, and he took them for a ride, and they were rambunctious in the back seat. And so we, we came up with this uh, game called, uh, we just took all the you know copyright free games that we could. We did scavenger hunts and dot dots and hangman and all that. We called it backseat battles. We had it printed and we said, let's really be thoughtful for parents. And we'll put both of the books together and then we'll wrap it. So you buy two books for one. We thought that was a great idea, and that was my first introduction to bookstores, because as soon as they got them, they took the wrapper off, split the book down, and sold each one of them, so they doubled their profit. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I learned that there were tricks, and I was very naive. Uh, so, Roland and I started, uh, the first, after Baxi Battles, he had a collection of magazines from 1872. And so we had some great fun. We went in there, and we took, we called it Ulysses S. Grant, ate this question mark? You know, Tips and Hints for Living in 1872. And it, it had, it was tips. It was a fun book to do. I, I spiral bound, plastic bound it, and, you know, had fun. And um, it sold like 50 copies or something. And it told you, you know, how to paint a house in winter, because that's when you're supposed to paint a house, because if you paint in winter, the paint does not seep into the wood, which is what's supposed to happen. You can see how thinking changes over 130 years. How to cook and prepare a calf's head for some dinner, um, proper fashions, what the young lady should wear, how you should touch a girl on her hand, and you know, all of that. And so um, Roland, uh, you know, moved south, and uh, we've lost touch. I don't think he's doing well. But I've been trying to reach him because I made a promise to him. I said, Roland, I'm going to publish your book. And Roland Bowell, he's probably 86 to 90 now. His whole life has been collecting the names of authors from New York State and categorizing their works. <coughs> but he's very particular. He won't take anybody after 1852. And that book, I mean, it's, it's got, I think it's, it's, it's a research book. It's a reference, um, not a bestseller by any means. But I'm worried that it's lost. And all of that lifetime of work is gone. And so that's one of the things I've got to do is I've got to find Roland or find his family. I've got to get that manuscript and get that into the archive someplace. Um, and I'm thinking of archives because the other thing that has drawn me is my, my journalism knowledge. But um, in the microwave here, in, in the microwave, in the microfilm here in South, if you go back to the 18, 1980s, there was an old fellow who worked in the purchasing department here. His name was Seaver Rice. And Seaver uh, was a veteran of World War I. And, uh, you know, he 
uh, liked to tell stories. He wrote a column every Saturday. He'd bring it in in his ancient handwriting, and I'd try to decipher it and all. And um, Cedar belonged to a last man's club. And, uh, you know, there were five of them. They all served in the same area in France during World War I. They all came home. They bought a jug of wine, and they said, we will get together on an annual basis. We'll, we'll toast the bottle of wine, and the last man living is going to drink that bottle. And so, you know, every year they get together, do the whole thing. And so finally it turns out that Seaver survives the others. And so one day, and this would eat, Seaver would have been 90 something, he shuffles in, he's got the bottle in his hand, and uh, he says, Well, it's a sad day, but I'm the guy that gets to drink the bottle of champagne. I said, Well, geez, that's really cool, Seaver. You know, too bad about, you know. So I look at the bottle, I said, Seaver, this bottle says 1982. And he says, Yeah, I know, we kept losing the bottle. You know, so, um, <laughs> But that's, again, you know, the things that you have to notice about history. But in Seaver's column, and Barry, and this is why I do a lot of stuff with newspaper columns and re-editing re um, them and getting them into a, compilations, is Seaver wrote a story that's in the archives. And he grew up in the Adirondack area. His father was a known as the hermit of Mount Saranac. But he also owned what we call a tubercula hotel. Back at the turn of the century, 1900 or so, folks, uh, tuberculosis big deal, you'd all want to come out, get the good fresh air, and they had these places upstate where you could go. And so Seaver tells a story about how one day he is out uh, skinny dipping in the lake. And his father comes out and he just reads on the act. You know, I've got paying people here, paying clients. They don't need to see naked boys running around and all this. And all of a sudden, this old fellow comes up with his cane. He's got a beautiful white linen suit on him. He says, don't you yell at those boys like that. There was many a time that I swam bare-assed in the Mississippi River. And it was Mark Twain. And it's a great story, and it's lost in the microfilm. And so that's why I have this thing about newspaper columns, because it's in there. And if you don't remember it, how many people are going to come across microfilm at the Southridge Evening News and, and find stumble upon the Seaver story? And there's just thousands of them. They're, they're in weekly newspapers in Vermont, Connecticut, and all over. And so that's one of the things that I like to do is, is try and find these old special stories. All right. So I repackaged stuff. I had a love of syndicated materials, crossword puzzles. I bought crossword puzzles from um, a syndicate rep. United Media. I package them, I put them together, I mail them out. I really thought I was a cool publisher. I did everything. I did a little one at a time stat saddle stitcher, and I punch my little things, and I do the labels and all that. And it really went well, and I had fun doing it. Then I moved to New Hampshire, and I said, I gotta do more. And so I, I said, everything is local. And so I said, I'm gonna make word search puzzles. So I had a little program and I did it and I couldn't afford, you know, full color and all that. So I had my little plastic comb binder and I run them off eight and a half by eleven. And I, I went on the road in the summer if I had a couple days. I'd go up in Vermont with my syndicate books and my crosswords and my word searches. And I I couldn't afford the color. So what I did was I'd have them run off on 60 pound white and I'd get fabric pens, which wouldn't run. And at night I'd stay up and I'd just color them. You know, not everything, but maybe the hat or something like that. And that was really my start. And I said, this is kind of fun. I, I like this publishing thing. I, I don't, I'm not good at selling. I've got to go in and, you know, if you're a newspaper guy, there's a big gap. You've got to protect yourself against your relationships and especially with businesses. And, you know, it's a car dealer going to tell you not to run that crash story in the paper or all of that. And so I, I'm very shy about getting out there and selling. Um, but I made the decision in 2000 uh, that the newspaper world, I could go out, I could work with editors uh, doing some association work, but I could all of a sudden become a publisher. 
And so I went out and um, I, I started publishing books. You know, that was a long time away, but I decided I was going to do it. Um, and then, you know, so I, I just jotted down here, and I'm all over the place, I know that, but um, I've, I've talked about reason for hope. Um, and I guess I've learned that we're not in the book business. Uh, we're in the reading business. You know, uh, rock songs from the 60s, you know, feed your head. Um, that's what we're into, you know. And some of us are high tech and we're very good at it. Some of us are old tech. And we're really good at old tech. Um, some are new tech, some are technically behind the times, but that's okay. We're reaching readers with what we do. I can't sell a Fritz Weatherby book in Haverhill, Massachusetts, or in Burlington, Vermont, or in Saco, Maine. He's a New Hampshire guy, and that's all. And so I have to control that market for my Fritz books. But I, I guess I know I've got to publish ebooks. I haven't done it yet. I'm going to. But my my thing is, you know, you're holding a book in your hand, and then once you start reading it, it becomes very high tech because where do the words and where do the thoughts go? They end up in your brain, and they're churning around in there and twirling around, and there's nothing more high tech than what's in there. So. Um, that's really mysterious technology. And so we keep changing and changing and changing our platforms. Um, and so I have problems with ebooks, um, but you know we're going to do them, and this year we will. And I think there's great opportunity. I tell people there's more opportunity in publishing now than there ever has been. And uh, it's just a matter of thinking that you're not Random House. You know, you don't have to be. You, you, it's okay to be the biggest book publisher in Concord, New Hampshire, because that's your market. And because not everybody in Concord, New Hampshire wants to read everything I do. I mean, p people come to me and say, will you publish my book of poetry? And I say, I won't. I'm sorry. One, I'm not smart enough. I know what poetry is, but I'm not smart enough to know what, that, what you really mean by that picket fence. Um, and so I don't know good poetry from bad poetry. And I said, really? I would do you a disservice because I can't sell your book in Fargo, North Dakota. I, I can sell some books in Connecticut, and, and I do, but I have to know who I am, and, and I have to know that my market, I feel comfortable in New Hampshire. I know that I can go into the Toadstool bookstores and say to Willard, how you doing? Have I got something for you and your three stores here in this area? Um, and for you public, I mean, most of the writers, we abandon them pretty quickly. I mean, that's, you know, everybody talks about the three months and you're out. Um, some books get new lives, and they keep coming, and they keep coming. Um, I, when I was in Nashua, New Hampshire, um, our assistant sports editor did this big story. It was the first big book I really kind of wanted to publish. I, I felt that more than, it wasn't going to be a commercial success, but it was going to be a contribution to society. And I'm really big on this. I mean, I'm into ethics and right to know and all of that, but I was really, really concerned about the legacy that we leave behind. And so I published in 2002 a book called Dem Little Bumps, The Nashua Dodgers. Mm. Now, uh, this was 2002, and I've got a major push coming up on this book. And do you know why? Because in 1946, when Roy Campanella and I'm going to forget his name right off, <laughs> um, was playing baseball, was one of two black guys playing baseball in Nashville, New Hampshire. At the same time, number 42, they've got a movie about it right now. Jackie Robinson was in Montreal playing professional baseball. Newcomb and Campanella were the first two African-American baseball players in the United States to integrate baseball. And they did it in Nashville, New Hampshire, about an hour and a half from here. A couple of stories. They got hooked. 
It was the first time they could go in the front door of a restaurant and they got hooked on clam strips at Howard Johnson's. Mm -hmm. It was, and every time they hit a home run, a fellow would uh, donate 10 chickens to them. So I think Campanella sent his father a truckload of chickens at the end of the year for the farm. And so all of a sudden I've got this book that is always shoot the fall. <laughs> Um, so I've got this book that tells the story about baseball in the United States when Jackie Robinson was in Montreal. It's been out for 12 years. You know, I have not abandoned my author. I still market this. Two years ago, he was on National Public Radio, on the nationwide broadcast. And so opportunities always come up. And so here you have it. You know, you want to read about the integration of baseball in the United States? Go to Nashville. Find out that they had a favorite barber because he couldn't cut African American hair. He didn't know how to do it. So what did they say to him? Just buzz cut the stuff off. So that's why they had their hair like that was because they did not, you know, the French Canadian barber in Nashville certainly didn't know how to do uh, African hair. So I think these are fascinating. Um, my glimmer of hope, <coughs> and this is, yeah. No vacancy. It's called The Rise, Demise, and Reprise of America's Motels by Mark Oakland. He teaches at Plymouth State University in New Hampshire. He's, a, he's the guy that, you know, in New Hampshire says, we're going to have 5 million tourists in New Hampshire over the Labor Day weekend. He figures this all out. Um, Mark wrote this book. He's very proud of it. Didn't go anywhere. He did it as an e-book, and it's not the kind of book that's an e-book. This is a grab-and-go book that comes from, um, you know, the bookstore. And so I said to Mark, you know, I want to get some other of your books. I'm very opportunistic. I mean, I tend to go for what I call New Hampshire celebrities. Doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people, but Fritz is a New Hampshire celebrity. Mark, uh, Mark Oakland writes about... Um, Murders in the hotels of New Hampshire, the big <coughs> hotels, the ones up in the mountains, the Balsams, the Grandview, um, and uh, Mount Washington. Mm -hmm. And so I said, I want those. And so we're going to do that. We're, we're, we're talking now about getting all those books back in print and all this fun stuff. And so um, the cool story is I have taken an e-book and I've pushed it back to hard copy. Woo. And <laughs> so I think that's... Cool. I mean, and, and so um, I don't know how many it's going to sell. I, I don't, you know, if it sells 10, I'm going to be delighted because it's just an indication that not everything is going to be on the web and is going to sell. And if it's an ebook, maybe some of it does. But for the most part, I got an author who sells a lot of books who said, gee, I think I really need a hard copy book. And you know, for the for just for the public relations alone, just to be able to stand before you and mm -hmm. say, I took an ebook to hardback because it took paperback because that's how the only way it would really sell. What it, I mean, that makes me feel pretty good. Um, I think that um, you know we've heard a lot about self-published, and um, I don't really think based on what you Lydia, we we always oh, skipped out, but. I don't think he's a self-publisher, Bill. I don't. I don't up in Vermont. I mean, the problem with ebooks and self-publishing is, and I had a woman tell me this uh, at our writers' day a couple of weeks ago in New Hampshire. I had to get my book out. It was about my parents in World War II, what they went through, their experiences. They were elderly. I couldn't wait to go through the traditional publishing. I couldn't wait that two years. I couldn't wait to track down a, a publisher that would do it. I couldn't. I had this was more a book for my parents than it was for anybody else. It's doing okay. She said, that's why I went to self-publish. And you know what I said? Bless you. Because there's probably nothing more delightful than to be able to present a book with your name on the cover to your parents. You know, what a gift. And so um, I don't fault her for that at all. But I do fault um, the instant gratification. 
And I'm a newspaper guy. I can remember I'd write something at 10 a.m. in the morning and <laughs> see it in print, you know, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. So I understand that. But, you know, Bill was talking about how he's got editors and proofreaders and copy editors and all that. That's what I do. And he probably does it better than I do. He's probably got two more steps in there. He says he's a self-publisher, but he's doing everything right. Um, you know, right now, everything is fantasy and werewolves and vampires and, you know, things. And every kid is writing that book. And there are some very good adults that are doing it, and they're doing it very, very well. But with self-publishing, you've got the kids that think they're going to get this right out there, and I think probably they're going to do it. But I've seen more and more, the books are up there because, and no offense to a high school English teacher, if there's anybody here that's a high school English teacher, I'm sorry, but you don't take your book and give it to a high school English teacher and think that's the first and only step you need to do in your book publishing. God love teachers. I'm a, I'm a writer because of high school English teachers, but it's a different skill set. And you need to do the skills that book editors, copy editors, proofreaders have to make your book a success. Um, I'm delighted Archer's here. He did our keynote for Writer's Day last year. Um, we, we write for the same magazine, and we share, we grouse about our editor a lot together. And um, uh, last year, I got a chance to write a, a story about the mystery writers of northern New England. And one of them was, was Archer for Vermont, uh, Jerry Boyle over in Maine, and uh, Brendan Dumois in New Hampshire. So a good relationship with all of them, so I felt comfortable doing it. Um, and so I'm doing research on mystery writers of New England anyway. And I come across a first edition hardback book by a very well-known mystery writer. So I pick it up, I start reading it, I'm lost. I get confused. I mean, the blonde becomes a brunette by page 45, and I don't know why, you know? And so um, it was self-published. And um, I don't know who did it, but it was probably, you know, rammed through, and uh, it just didn't do it. Writer now has you know major contract and you see the name everywhere and everything else. But I just I advocate constantly to self publishers. I don't care if you're self published. People think because I'm a traditional publisher, I, I'm against them. I'm not. There's room for everybody. Chances are, if you come to me with a book you want to self publish, I don't want it anyway. I mean, it's it's just not going to work for me. I have to sell so much, so many books to get my money out of it. You know, he was very telling about how much, you know, he puts into his books and how much it costs. i got to get my money out. And I'm not a bloodsucker. I'm not a, 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 you know, the monster on the screen and stuff. But I want to do a good job for my writers. And I want to market them. I want to give them a good cover. I want to give them copy editing. I want to give them a chance to write a second book um, and to see it succeed. So... Um, somebody mentioned tinkers, and I just, you know, I have to tell you, one of the marketing things you should do, you gotta talk. You gotta go to these things, you gotta go to writing conferences, you gotta go out there and talk to people. Um, at Writers Day, which is a signature event for the New Hampshire Writers Project, um, two members of our board were talking, I'm gonna say five years ago, and I could be off. And Michelle Filgate worked at a book bookstore down in Portsmouth. She's raving to Becky Sinkler, who's on our board, about this great book. You've got to read Tinkers by Paul Hardy. It's just incredible. And so Becky says, who's the retired editor of the New York Times Book Review. And Becky says, Michelle, you don't know what I'm currently working on right now, do you? So Michelle goes, no, I, I thought, thought you lived up at Santa Sandwich, you know. She goes, no. She says, right now, I am, I'm the chair of the fiction committee of the Pulitzer. And so on Monday, the call goes to the publisher at Bellevue in, in New York, probably the 200th publisher that was approached. And the books uh, were immediately sent to the judges in the fiction category. And um, Paul Harding won the Pulitzer that year. And 
Uh, he beat out all the established. I mean, he, he beat out the established writers. And so you got to think uh, a chance discussion amongst friends brought somebody a Pulitzer. And uh, and this is how it plays out. Uh, Paul Hardy comes to Writers' Day. He brings his editor with him, and uh, he's talking about the success of you know being the successful author. And we have a chance to talk. And, I, and one of the things was, they were all saying how Paul just got this major contract with a major publisher and all that. And so I said to them, you know, Bellevue Publisher, they, they're a small publisher, they specialize in health publishing. And um, I said, well, doesn't that make you feel bad that Paul's not with you anymore? Uh, and she said, no. She said, one, we're still the publisher of Tinkers, so we get all that benefit. Um, and for the money it would have cost us to keep Paul with us, we would have been able to do nothing else. And so that money is now there for me to go out and find new talent, uh, new authors, and, and at that same meeting, that same conversation, sitting across the table is this fellow who teaches at New Hampshire Institute of Art. His name is Tim Horvath. And he says, you know, by the way, he says, I've got this book. Do you think you'd be interested in looking at it? And I think it was, what, the spring era that uh, his book was published by Bellevue. So it happens, and you've got to do that. You've got to play on these relationships. It's very difficult for writers and publishers. I think we're basically shy. I'm the guy that stands in the corner with most of these things. Um, we're shy people, and I know I don't sound it right now, but I'm <laughs> on <laughs> um, And so um, you've got to talk, and you've got to believe in your own stuff. You've got to believe in your own words, and it, it, that means if you're a publisher, you've got to really, you, you've got to be married to your authors. Um, I disappointed appointed a few. I know I have. I'm really slow. And um, you know, I, I, I'm trying to manage too many things, and I also write. I'm sitting on my own stories that I got to write, and I feel I'm not doing a service to myself. But um, I got to, I got to stop. Um, <laughs> so I guess I just want to tell you that um, if you're a book publisher, or if you're a writer, writer is really cool. I think you know that's. That's the ultimate. But it was, if it wasn't for the publishers, it wouldn't happen. And publishers are faceless. You know, tell people you're a publisher, they go, "Oh, what do you do?" You know, they see dollar signs. You know, yeah. and uh, oh, you're the guy that makes all the money that makes the books come out and all that. And you go, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." <laughs> um, you know, I learned a long time ago that uh, the fewer words you have in front of your name, the more power you've got. So um, if, you, if you're in a newspaper and you're an assistant metro editor, that's cool. City, edit, city editor is pretty cool. But if you're just editor, that means a lot. I mean, that's number one. You know, there's only one person who can really fire you, and that's the guy that owns the newspaper or the woman. And, uh, but they don't usually do it until after you've screwed up. Um, but um, editor is a powerful thing. People writing letters, they, dear editor, to the editor, letter to the editor. And they sound off, and they think you know everything. They think you know that you're, you know, stealing from the town, or they think they know who you're sleeping with, or they think you know uh, what you did when you're 18 when you're busted for pot. Or, you know, I had a guy once come up to me. He was very rude and insulting, and told me I was no good, and I worked for a dumb paper, and all that. Somebody came up afterwards, and apologized, and said, "Well, you know why? Because 30 years ago, your paper put his, na his dad's name in because he got arrested for drunk driving." And so I'm paying for you know something I didn't do, but I would have done the same thing. I've had lawyers come up and say, as an editor, would you keep my drunk driving thing out? I said, nope, sorry. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. <laughs> um, so if you publish books, be loyal to your authors. I know they can be difficult. I know, especially the new ones, they think that you might be stealing their ideas. Um, big thing. Uh, I've gone through that a lot. You know, I don't really want to share my stuff with you because it's an idea that I don't want to see somebody else steal. It's so good. Um, and and um, understand that when you go out on the road, we tell in New Hampshire the story about this little known author. He has a book published. Um, he goes to the bookstores in New London, New Hampshire. Um, everybody nods, passes him by. Um, he goes out. 
publisher gets a major publisher, but you know they print maybe three, four hundred books. They don't go anywhere, and so he just stays at it. He keeps marketing, and he goes out, and he goes out, and he goes out. And now that bookstore in New London would love to have Dan Brown visit. <laughs> and so that's what happens. You have to tell authors you got to work. Dan Brown worked to create what he did. He's a hell of a writer, there's no question about it, but he worked to make Da Vinci Code work. He worked to sell Digital Fortress. And so it's not like it was handed to him. This guy busted it, and he believed in himself. And I think the responsibility is for authors to believe in themselves, but I think publishers have to do the same thing. And lastly, go out and recruit authors. Don't let them come to you. Go out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do that a lot now. I, I got a reputation, I, you know, the celebrity thing. I like celebrity thing because I think they've got enough of a name, and I know they're going to hustle, that um, they're going to sell their books. I just did a book by a DJ in, in Manchester, New Hampshire, largest radio station in the state. He really hustles. I mean, he's got the morning talk, and he's got a good show. Everybody calls in and everything, but I know he's going to hustle. And his memoir is selling great because Mike's out there selling books all the time. So. Um, and the other thing is, I tell my authors this, I have just given you the keys to eternity. I've given you a book. And I tell my authors, do you remember in the, one of the final scenes of one of the Planet of the Apes movies, they're down in the subway, you know, they, they get down, they're dusting stuff off, they find a doll that goes mama, and they go down further. I said, what do they find? They find a book. And I said, you know what? That was your book. And so books live forever. Bookstores are always going to be around. They might be used bookstores or something else, but everybody's going to want books. And so you just keep doing what you got to do. If you decide you're going to take one ebook and that's what it's going to be, and one paperback or tra trade book, go for it. I mean, you've been given a great legacy here, and you need to take chances with writers. I've lost my shirt on some books. There's no question about that. Um, but I've also had some that have been able to, um, you know, make up the difference, kind of like uh, Paul Harding does with for Tinkers and, and Bellevue Press. So um, I guess I'm just saying, you know, I don't know much. I make a lot of mistakes. I'm really slow. I can be frustrating. But I'm very loyal to my authors, and I think they are to me. And I've told my authors, too, you get a better deal, go with them. Because this is about you. It's not about me. And so have fun. Any questions? Thank you. <laughs> More informally, sure. At at seven thirty tomorrow morning till eight forty five, there'll be a breakfast. Uh, just to tell you now, so that if we you know forget it this evening, um, and, and if there's some burning questions, we can do it. But I just wanted to recognize that it is six thirty, and uh, we're uh, invited to go see the exhibitors and have a reception. But a burning question, perhaps. Burning questions? Not. Okay, good. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs>